The topic of this presentation is the passion of Jesus Christ, discernment, and the role of the Virgin Mary. This is extremely important. St. Teresa of Avila said that the most powerful thing that we can meditate upon is the passion of Christ. And during Lent and Holy Week especially, we meditate upon the passion of Christ. But what I want to do is first reflect why did Jesus die on the cross? Our popular culture would say that Christians believe that Jesus died on the cross so that we could have our sins forgiven. And that is true. That's true. He died for the salvation of souls. But it's a little bit shallow. God became a man so that man could become like God. The purpose of the crucifixion, the reason why Christ did this, is so that God and man could become one. Very intimate, very passionate. What's the purpose of all of the sacraments? Union with God. What is the purpose of the crucifixion? Union with God. What is heaven? Union with God. St. Maximilian Kolbe, who we're going to lean heavily upon in this little presentation, says that Christian perfection is union with God. That is the entire purpose of the Christian life, and that is the entire purpose of discernment. All of the promises that our Lord makes throughout the New Testament, all of them hinge upon this one thing, doing the will of God. So important, our Lord said, not all of those who say, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of their heavenly Father. Our Lord said that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will do mightier deeds in my name. I have to go to the cross. I must leave you so that you can have the Holy Spirit. You will know my disciples because they cast out demons, they eat poison, they heal the sick, all of these wonderful deeds we're supposed to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do if, keyword, if we do the will of God. The will of God must be our fixed ideal. It must be our constant thought. It must be the thing that we desire above all else. And I'm going to briefly give you four reasons why. Number one, our happiness, our happiness on this earth can only be satisfied by doing the will of God. Our souls are made by God to be satisfied only within and through God. So if I want to have peace of soul, if I want to have happiness that lasts for all of eternity, I must seek above all else to do the will of God. Secondly, my holiness is dependent upon me doing the will of God. Maximilian Colby, again, has a great math equation that I do not tire of sharing. So when he was giving a conference to seminarians in Rome, he put on the chalkboard the capital V. We're going to use the capital W. He put a capital V, which stood for voluntas in Latin, which represented the will of God. So imagine a large capital W, a plus sign, a lowercase w equals S. He explained to the seminarians, the spiritual life consists of this. The will of God, my will. I simply have to unite my will to God's will, and that equals sanctity. That plus sign is a little bit deceiving, though. That plus sign is the cross. Jesus died on the cross to show us that the two wills are obviously the same. They're perfectly united, but it's a sacrifice. It's going to hurt. So, too, in the Christian life, our Lord said, He who wishes to save his life must lose it. To do the will of God means that my will has to die. That dying of my will to fulfill the will of God equals sanctity. So my holiness, my happiness are dependent upon one thing, the union of my will with God's will, of course, also the sacramental life. Why else must I have the will of God as my fixed ideal? For the salvation of other people. Why did Jesus die on the cross? He died so that we may live in the spiritual life. If there's going to be supernatural life, there has to be a death. And that death is going to be the death of our own will. That's why so often our Lord said, he who wishes to save his life must lose it. Anybody who loses his life for my sake will save it. Again, our union with God happens within and through the cross of Jesus Christ. Also, the fourth reason why we should strive to do the will of God, because all of those promises, the promises of God's providence, if there is a father who is good, who would give his son bread over a stone, would somebody give somebody a fish over a serpent? God will provide all of these things for you. The providence of God is dependent upon us being united to the will of God. So the will of God is our fixed ideal. Now let's get to Mary. Mary is the secret to discernment. 
All of the greatest saints, all of the doctors of the church agree that Mary is the fastest, the sweetest, the most secure path towards union with Jesus Christ. The goal, union with Jesus Christ, the path with in and through the Virgin Mary. Let us go back to that math equation from St. Maximilian Kolbe, because the will of Mary and the will of God are perfectly united. Because she's immaculate, she never deviated from the will of God. It is easy for me to say that the will of Mary is the same thing as the will of God. This is important for us. I can say, Blessed Mother, what is your will? Blessed Mother, what is God's will? The answer to that prayer is exactly the same, except that God the Father willed for us to have a mother. God the Father willed for us to have a mediatrix. God the Father willed that she be the spouse of the Holy Spirit. So because God the Father willed for her to play a special role in our life, to provide a certain sweetness, Mary is the fastest, sweetest, most secure path to the will of God. I could say that the will of Mary is the sweetest version of the will of God for me. Their wills are the same. God has willed for me to have Mary to provide me with the nurturing care, the nurturing love of a mother. So I could say, I'm re-emphasizing, the will of Mary and the will of God are the same. Jesus obeys his mother. The voice of Mary in the life of Christ, because he had to obey her, you could say is the voice of the Father speaking through her. So Mary is immaculate. Mary's will never deviated from the will of the Father, but God the Father has willed that all of us have Mary as our mother, and so therefore, because she makes things sweeter, I can say that the will of Mary is the sweetest version of God's will for me. Of course, all of you are familiar with the wedding feast of Cana, where Jesus says, it is not my hour. Jesus is being very clear. All the doctors of the church agree that this is Jesus' way of saying, I'm not going to do this except this is going to happen, of course, because the Father knew all things. The Father willed that the mother would have sway over the Son. So this is why St. Alphonsus says that Mary is omnipotent by grace. God is omnipotent by nature. Mary is omnipotent by grace as a free gift for us. So Our Lady even has sway over the heart of God. I want to make all of this clear as we go forward. How is Mary the most secure, the sweetest path to discerning the will of God? Because she is mother, Mary loves me because I am a member of the body of Christ. If Mary's my mother, I'm united to Christ. Mary loves me because I am a member of the body of Christ. Mary loves me with the love that she has for Christ. Mary's desire, Mary's goal, besides, of course, giving me sweetness, giving me nourishment, she can't resist me because she's pure mercy and love, but Mary's goal is to make me like Christ. Mary desires what Christ desires. What does Christ desire? God's will to be done for me to do the will of Christ. So by going to Mary, because she's my mother, her soul magnifies the Lord. She is essential, she is critical, and she desires infinitely more than I could ever comprehend. She desires for me to do the will of God infinitely more. So if my discernment is to discern the spirits, to discern what is God's will for my life, nobody has a greater vested interest in my soul, in me doing the will of God, than Mary because she's the mother of God and she loved Christ with the love that only the Immaculate Mother of God could have. So I go to Mary in my discernment because she's mother. I go to Mary in my discernment because she's mediatrix. To discern the will of God, to discern these movements, to hear the voice of God is a grace. It is a gift from God for my salvation. Mary is the mediatrix of every grace. All the doctors agree. God doesn't have to do it this way, but he finds it fitting that no grace is given without Mary. So St. Bernadine says she is not only the treasurer, she's the treasurer and she gives what she wills, to whom she wills, as often as she wills, as much as she wills. So if I'm gonna get the grace, I might as well go to the mediatrix of all grace. St. Bernard, and of course all the doctors agree, that never was it known that anybody who called upon her name was not left unaided. So if you have two souls identical, discerning the exact same thing, except one soul calls upon the name of Mary and asks for assistance in discernment, that soul will receive more because of her efficacious intercession as mediatrix of all grace, because it honors God the Father, it makes me like Christ. Why does it make me like Christ? Because Christ was dependent upon his mother, of course. 
Also, Mary is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. So important. In discernment, what are you discerning? You're discerning the voice of God from the voice of the devil. When you're discerning, discerning the voice of God, we call that consolation. Who is the source of consolation? Who is the consoler? The Holy Spirit. Mary is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Maximilian Kolbe says, where Mary is, the Holy Spirit comes. So when you're discerning spirits, you call upon the name of Mary, her spouse, the consoler comes, you receive the consolation to know the will of God. Mary crushes the head of the serpent. What does the serpent bring? The serpent brings desolation. So Mary will crush desolation. Everybody goes through desolation. But with Mary, you will have a special protection. It won't last as long. And now this is going to bring me to the heart of the matter because this is the Lenten season, because we're in Holy Week. Our Lady of Sorrows has a particular charism under this title for discernment. Why? What is the origin for Our Lady of Sorrows? The prophecy of Simeon, a sword will pierce your heart so that the thoughts of many might be revealed. If Mary is the fastest path to Jesus Christ, the fastest path through Mary is through her pierced heart. By praying to Our Lady of Sorrows under that title specifically, many, many, many wise and learned saints have agreed that this is a special title of Our Lady of Sorrows, our Lady of the Passion, you could call her, to get to the heart of the matter. Why? Because when we look at the Passion of Jesus Christ through the pierced heart of Mary, we are looking at it through the heart of a person who loved purely, who loved the most. When I look at the Passion of Christ through my own eyes, through my own heart, I bring with it all of the junk, all of the confusion, all of the self-love and self-interest. But when I look at the Passion of Jesus Christ, through the most pure, through the most sorrowful heart of Mary, I am looking at it with clean and clear eyes. In discernment, a lot of times we don't clearly hear the voice of God, the saints say, because God is not apt to talk to people who are not open to His will. What do you mean? I'm discerning God's will, but sometimes we don't really want to know. We're in this discernment process, but we really don't want to hear what God has to say because we're not open to it because what God has to say is the cross. But when you have a devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows, and I'm going to give you a very specific devotion that I'm going to recommend to you. When you have a devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows, with the sword that pierced her heart, she begins to cut away these attachments that keep us from hearing the voice of God. Because her soul magnifies the Lord, we're able to hear the voice of God more clearly. So I want to conclude with this. There is a novena that I've been praying, that I have experienced its fruits. It's called the Irresistible Novena. It consists of this. It's very simple. You state your intention, whatever that might be. This is extraordinarily effective if you're discerning something. If there's some hidden mystery in your life, if there's some hidden defect, your predominant defect, if you're suffering from a diabolical obsession, or in other words, an extraordinary desolation, this is really, really, really powerful. The devil flees from Our Lady of Sorrows. He flees from the Passion of Christ. And how much more is he gonna flee from the perfect magnifying glass, the most pure vision of the Passion of Christ that I can have is through her heart. He's gone. So it's very powerful for that. So you come up with your intention. Number two, you pray a seven sorrows rosary. So you're meditating upon the sorrow of Jesus through the sorrowful heart of the Virgin Mary. And this is going to purify your intentions. You're going to notice, wow, your prayers are going to be answered very fast because of your, your intention is more pure. Her intercession is extraordinarily powerful because you're consoling the heart of Mary. Jesus wants nothing more than for his mother to be consoled and Mary wants nothing more than for the heart of Jesus to be consoled. After you pray your seven sorrows rosary, you pray the litany of Our Lady of Sorrows. After you're done with that, it's over. So your intention, seven sorrows rosary, the litany of Our Lady of Sorrows. Before we conclude, let us briefly review the seven sorrows of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I will share with you how to remember them. The prophecy of Simeon is the first sorrow. You can remember that because a single sword pierced her heart. At that moment, everything that Our Lady experienced was tinged with sorrow. Even when she saw Jesus playing and laughing and smiling, there was sorrow in that, knowing what was gonna happen to him. 
The second sorrow of the Blessed Virgin Mary, again, it's easy to remember because it's kind of twofold, the flight into Egypt and the massacring of the innocents. This is very sad for the Virgin Mary because although Jesus came to save all people, the very people that he came to save are persecuting him even from such a tender young age. The third sorrow of the Blessed Virgin Mary is easy to remember because he was lost for three days. So Our Lady, being his mother, loved Jesus more than anybody else. But on top of that, because she's immaculate, she loved God above all else. So the great sorrow and anguish that she experienced from having lost not just her son, but the creator of heaven and earth, the Alpha and the Omega, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the fourth sorrow of the Blessed Virgin Mary is easy to remember. This is also the fourth sorrow of the Most Holy Rosary. Jesus and Mary met on the way of the cross, the great sorrow of having seen him treated so cruelly. The fifth sorrow of the Blessed Virgin Mary is also the fifth sorrow of the Most Holy Rosary, the crucifixion and death of Jesus on the cross. We imagine the lance piercing Jesus' heart, but we forget our Lord is already dead at this point. He didn't experience any pain from this piercing of his heart. Who experienced all of the pain? The Virgin Mary. The sword pierced her heart. The saints say on that day with a single lance, two hearts were pierced. The sixth sorrow of the Blessed Virgin Mary is Jesus' removal from the cross and Our Lady holding the lifeless body of Jesus Christ. What thoughts went through her mind to have the true body of Christ but for the first time, there being no real presence. And the seventh sorrow of the Blessed Virgin Mary is placing her divine son in the tomb. I want to encourage you on your path. Cling to the will of God because it's all that matters. It's all that matters in the spiritual life. Union with God. That is the essence of Christianity. That is the purpose of Holy Week. That is the purpose that God became a man so that you could become like God. You could be united, you can be divinized by the Logos. But the fastest, most effective way to do that is with, in, and through Mary, but most specifically, the pierced heart of Mary. Let us conclude in prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed Mother, we consecrate our Holy Week to you. Everything that comes through your sorrowful and immaculate heart is pleasing to God, and we desire above all else to be pleasing to God. Help us to draw close to Him. Help us to hear His voice and see His face. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, God love you, and we'll see you very soon.